everyone. Good morning. Um, here we are at the Aspen Ideas Festival. I'm Casey Schwartz, and I'm honored to be on stage with three extraordinary thinkers and artists as we explore a subject that obsesses all of them, beauty. But this is no surface level or even merely academic inquiry. For these panelists, understanding how and why we respond to beauty is actually nothing less than a question of human flourishing. So we're gonna get into all of that today and more. Let me introduce our speakers. <clears throat> On my left, Susan Magsiman, <clears throat> founder and executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab, the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics, an initiative from the Peterson Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She is also the author of the Impact Thinking Model and the co-director of Neuro Arts Blueprint Initiative, which is a partnership with the Aspen Institute. David Byrne, at the end, barely needs introducing, but of course is the ultimate polymath, musician, artist, writer, Broadway star, and the brain behind the upcoming immersive art exhibit, Theater of the Mind, which opens in Denver this fall. And Suchi Reddy, um, artist and architect, founder of the architectural design firm ReadyMade, Suchi has designed everything from Google's flagship store in New York City to a sculptural installation now up at the Smithsonian. <clears throat> One more person is not here in the, in the physical, literal sense um, because sadly he tested positive for COVID, but he will join us in a brief video clip from Philadelphia. This is Anjan Chatterjee, the great neurologist, neuroscientist, and the director of University of Pennsylvania's Center for Neuroaesthetics, um, and in some real way, sort of the philosopher king of this young and fascinating field. Um, so we will hear from Anjan in a few minutes. Um, Susan, let me turn to you first. Define for us this terrain. What is neuroaesthetics and, and what is at stake? Well, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I guess what I'd like to start by saying about neuroaesthetics is that it is the best word on the Scrabble board. It's worth, <laughs> it's worth about 20,000 points. So um, it's a big word, right? Neuroaesthetics, it's yeah. daunting. But what we talk about in terms of neuroaesthetics is quite simple. It's how your brain and body change on arts and aesthetic experience and how those changes can impact health and well-being and learning. And so, you know, you don't have to go very far to look around to see what an aesthetic experience is. It's not the day-to-day, -day, it's not the things that we do that I like to think of as transactional. It's the things that elevate us to a higher level that are truly transformational. So to kind of bring us all in, I'm gonna ask us to do a little bit of an experiment together. Um, if everyone would close your eyes, and take a deep breath, and for a moment, think about an art experience or an aesthetic experience that you've had for yourself or for a family member or a friend or a colleague. And it doesn't have to be a pleasurable experience. Aesthetics aren't all about pleasure. They're about emotion. And we have many, many emotions that we deal with pain. We deal with, with trauma. We deal with joy. We deal with pleasure. But think about just one moment where you're, you were moved, where you felt something change. And it could have been today, it could have been yesterday, it could have been 10 years ago, but hold that for a moment. Okay, so we're gonna move forward and just keep that in your mind's eye. Uh, I think it'll help you understand this idea of neuroaesthetics. And as Casey said, neuroaesthetics is something that has actually been around since the beginning of humanity. We've always been very interested in how we feel and what moves us. Plato and Aristotle and all the great thinkers and all the great healers and all the great artists have thought about what moves us, right? Um, but 
It wasn't until about 25 years ago that researchers finally started to catch up with the artists. And you know, the artists have always gotten there first. The artists have always understood what intuitively moves us. And I think that's super important. But the science is now coming up because of technology. And we can see inside the brain in a non-invasive way. So we can actually begin to understand function and structure, neurotransmitters. We can understand how neuroplasticity works on the arts and aesthetic experience. And that's giving us a lot of really great information and data to translate into practice. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, the way that neuroaesthetics works, or the way that our brains work, is that we bring the world in through our senses. So touch, smell, taste, sound, in your experiences that you were bringing up. Maybe you were expressively writing. Maybe you were listening to one of David's songs. Right? Maybe you were in your home at a fireplace. All of these sensory experiences are coming in all the time, and our brains are processing them. We now know that we don't have six senses. We probably have over 30 senses sensory systems that we're engaging with to really understand the world. And I think as the world gets more complicated, we're using more of them all the time. So neuroaesthetic researchers look at research from three different points of view. They look at, or three different categories, people, place, and things. And so with people and places, we share a lot of things in common, whether we're from different cultures, genders, ages, races. We tend to see things in a similar way. Things are the things that we create. They're human made. And it turns out that the, the personalization, our life experiences, the way that we have um, engaged in the world really changes the way we perceive things. So I'm going to just give you one example of that. Um, around the 1998-99, Samir Zeki, who is a neuroscientist at University, University College London, did an experiment on beauty. And he was very interested to understand, besides the visual cortex looking at something and seeing something, was there another part of the brain that lit up? And what he found was that the frontal cortex, the reward center of the brain, the pleasure center of the brain, lit up too. And that was totally new information. It was revolutionary. What we found was that um, not only was the image subjective and that it could have been a grotesque image, it could have been a horror image, it could have been something quote unquote beautiful. We each define beauty in our own way. So the takeaway is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And so how we see things really is about where we come from and who we are and how we create, oh, so interesting. There's a thumbprint on here, a fingerprint on this piece. We each have a neurobiological thumbprint based on who we are and what we've done in our lives. And nobody has the same brain thumbprint, the, the same fingerprint as each of us. So you know, we may think we see something together that's beautiful, but you're seeing it in your way. I'm seeing it in mine. And then together, we come together to really collaborate on what that dance looks like. So, so let me turn it back to you. Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, um, it's the things that have, it's, when it's a surprise, that's, that's when, that's when you learn, I, I think we learn to appreciate things. Uh, and so what's surprising is when you're looking at something and maybe you don't get it at first and then you return to it or keep looking and then you get it and that's that's kind of surprising because then you ha you have changed um, as a result of looking at this thing This is a big one, huh? Uh, nature, nurture, and uh, all that. Uh, I don't have an answer, but I have more questions. Thank you for joining us today. The program is about to begin. <laughs> there goes your surprise. Yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> OK. 
Uh, for instance, I started thinking about all these ideas of things that have been proposed as being what makes something beautiful. Symmetry, uh, the golden mean, that kind of, those kind of ratios. The rule of thirds, where you divide an, uh, an image or something into things and it kind of fits into these thirds. Uh, wow, uh, the Fibonacci series, mm -hmm. that, that, that applies to a lot of plants and also to a lot of creative things that we make. Uh, there are divine harmonies, the harmony of the spheres, um, the musical harmonies, the ancients people believed that, though, that the orbits of the planets and the, the other things in the world echoed musical harmonies. And they kind of do. The orbits of the planets kind of do echo musical harmonies. So you could see where this idea kind of struck. And so th this idea that there is a natural order to the universe and to what makes things beautiful, it gets put out. And that we see this reflected in the way leaves look and the way that seashells look and the ratios of different things. And when those things are echoed in the art and the music and whatever we make, it touches this universal sense of what we find beautiful. I'm not sure I believe all that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's really convincing. I find that understanding or attempting to understand things, whether it's the things I do, kind of analyzing my process or what I make or whatever, I really enjoy that. Other people hate it. Uh, there's other, there are plenty of creative people who go, no, I don't like self-examination. I don't like trying to figure out why I did it. I don't like asking those questions. I just do. And for me, I love examining that. Uh, to me, it enriches the experience. Uh, it's like if you look at whatever, something in nature or something in the architecture or something someone made and you go, how was that done? What decisions did they make? Why does it look like that? It doesn't diminish it, uh, for me anyway. It actually enriches it. And Katie, just to add to that, when you're doing it as an artist and you're learning about that process, when you're applying neuroaesthetics to health and well-being, you want to know dose and dosage. You want to know what the hurts are, the right hurts are for looking at Alzheimer's. You want to know what's working. And so you can translate this sort of idea of curiosity and, and, and exploration into really a practice, a field of practice. And I think that's the other reason why neuroaesthetics is really important. And, and in some ways, sort of what's at stake. Uh, sure. So, so we know, I think, intuitively, if we have family members that have autism or um, or some form of neurodegeneration, that music is incredibly soothing and comforting. It can release memory. It can help them open up to um, to you as a family member or friend. It can also help them with um, the term quality of life, which I think has really been underrated because the quality of our lives matter. And mood matters and cognition matters. And so what we know is that um, when music is sung or played, and especially autobiographical music, so music that you may have known as a child, that's salient, that you, you know that has touched you in some deep, deep uh, neurobiological chemical way, it helps you kind of come awake. And that's really a gift. Um, we know more about dose and dosage around that. So you know, what kinds of music are important for different people. It turns out to be very personal. So when you take it from the art to the and science to practical applications, and that's a field that's growing called neural arts, and that's the project that we're working on with Aspen Institute, is how do you harness this neurobiology and move it into practice for humankind? And, and I think that is the stake. That's really the stake, is, is how do we help people thrive and flourish using the arts and aesthetic experience. One of the 
uh, areas that we have been interested in is the way in which aesthetic and moral values get conflated. For example, there is something called the beauty is to stereotype. According to the stereotype, attractive people are thought to be more intelligent, more trustworthy, more competent, more hardworking, and so on. What we are finding is that people with minor facial anomalies, so scars, uh, birthmarks, uh, and other kinds of uh, defects, uh, such as burn marks, uh, are regarded as less intelligent, less competent, and less trustworthy. We have started identifying what parts of the brain are involved in these kinds of negative biases, negative biases of, of which often people are unaware of. We are also interested in the extent to which culture plays an important role in generating these biases in most people. For example, many movies, if you think about Bond villains, or if you think about the Marvel Universe, or, um, or Star Wars, villains often are depicted with some kind of facial anomaly. And this is a message we also give our children. For example, in the movie Lion King, one of the most popular children movies, the villain is even named after his facial anomaly, Scar. So understanding how these biases work and what we can do to mitigate them becomes important if we care about a just and equitable society. Whoops. Uh-oh. Spend more than 90% of our time in the built environment. This has become especially salient during the pandemic and the question is, what is it about the built environment uh, that has an effect on us? And how can uh, we understand principles by which the built environment uh, promotes human flourishing? For example, we have discovered that there seem to be three principal psychological components in our response to the built environment. And we are calling them coherence, how organized does the space appear? Fascination. Is this a space that you would like to explore? Is there something intriguing about the space? And hominess. How comfortable do we feel in the space? Do we think that we belong there? So well, on that note, we'll go right to Susie because no one could talk, no one could talk more, more brilliantly about the built environment. Um, I, um, I grew up in India and um, was lucky enough to have a father who had a friend who was an architect who taught himself. And he hired this friend to design our house, and which was unusual because generally people had builders build their houses and it was not a very thoughtful experience. Um, so I lived in this house that had a courtyard and was open to gardens on four sides. And I remember when I was 10 years old, I had this, my first epiphany, I call it, um, when I really knew that my house was changing me. It was making me different than my friends. It wasn't a better or worse thing. It was just, I was different. I was who I was because of my house. And that kind of drove me through all the trials of being an architect, a woman architect, a woman architect of color. May I not name those trials? Um, you know, to really pursue this, to really see the power of architecture, to affect people and affect how we feel in space. So my work has really been about orienting design from a place of feeling. How does someone feel? And bringing, you know, there's socioeconomic, sociopolitical, you know, neurobiological, everything to play, to understand all the different kinds of design, whether it's a commercial thing, you know, that's a retail flagship store, or it's someone's home, or their interior. I think about how people feel, and or whether it's my art installations that have to do with artificial intelligence, it doesn't matter. It's all about how we feel here because as Susan said, mood affects your health. It affects your personal well-being, it affects your mental well-being. And architecture is a huge tool just as David's work, you know, which is immersive, it's art, it's music. That affects how you feel. All of these things are um, levers, if you want to call them that, um, to really allow us to understand how to 
A, have a better world, be better humans in it, and be better humans to other people in it. And I think that we can really use design and architecture as a tool to get there. Mm -hmm. And here are some images from the What do you mean by that? Well, you know, when you're an architect, the first thing people ask you is, what do you specialize in? Really bothers me, because I say I specialize in diversity. The second question is, what's your style? And I always say, I'm a serenist. Whatever is serene for you, that thing I'm going to find, and that thing I'm going to make. Style is really, for me, not an important question. I really feel like that's, that's a very personal question, but it's not really in the scheme of design and in how it makes you feel, which is mm -hmm. really the work that you know, Susan and I have been doing together, which I can talk a little bit about in terms of some innovative projects where we brought science, art, technology together. Style, I really want to bring the discussion of architecture down to the body. I call this a democratic space. I think here we can all relate to each other regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our situations. You know, this is what feels. We build our worlds outside of here, and this is really where I want to think about world building. So one of the projects that Susan and I worked on together is called um, A Space for Being, and it was an installation that we did in Milan, and what we did is actually design three different spaces that had exactly the same function. So it was a living room and a dining room, and we made this in Milan, and we worked actually with Google and with a furniture company called Muto, and what Google did is design a band that um, tracked your bodily metrics. And so our challenge was to create, or my challenge, was to create these spaces where we could keep people for 10 minutes in each space without talking to each other, without looking at their phones, because they didn't have their phones, and give them things to do and really experience the space so that later we could reflect back to them where, as we called it, their bodies were most at ease. And it was really interesting. And the, and the data was also reflected, not as data, it was reflected as like a beautiful watercolor. And you could see these flares of where you were excited. And one of the most beautiful things was, and I, I made one room, the first room was like a, I drew from our cave, our history in caves, you know, so it was a very sort of cave-like space. And the lighting was from the bottom. And I had an 80-year-old cactus in there and, and flowers and, you know, all kinds of natural things and books about reading and making. And the second room was wildly colorful, had bossa nova music and lights everywhere and pop-up books, which were also a childhood fascination. And the third room was this kind of sublime room with like light coming down on you, you know, abstract art, all kinds of, you know, we made these sculptures that smelled of burned wood, they were really beautiful. And then people took off their bands, their data was deleted, but it was sort of reflected back to them. And one of the most beautiful things was also I had friends, and of course, because the data was deleted, I stood outside going, which one did you like? <laughs> and like doing my kind of uh, anecdotal research on this. Um, and one of the most wonderful things, that uh, two wonderful things that happened. One is I had two friends come out, and they compared their, their beautiful rings, and they were both flaring at the same time in a certain place, and they both had the... And it was when they smiled at each other. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, and they said, oh, that was when we looked at that book and we smiled at each other. And we know our bodies are reflecting all of this. You know, it's reflecting how we feel here today, what the sunlight's doing, how those balls are moving in that little pond over there. You know, we're taking all of this in, and it's really important that we use that information, you know, to try and make us be better humans. And the other thing was, you know, I had someone uh, who's a journalist, actually, who came in and said she was thinking about whether it was OK for her to be in these spaces, because she came from a developing country like I do. And it was also really interesting to see how people bring these things in. And there were so many surprises. You know, people, all, everyone thought they would be the most happy in the first room, which I had designed specifically that way, because I knew people were coming from looking at a lot of things, and I needed to level set. You know, but the truth was that some of them were not. And so it was about 50% of them got the results they thought they would get, and others got different ones. And it was so fascinating. I think that a big takeaway was that um, people um, were often not connected to their bodies. They had a thought, but it wasn't connected to how they were feeling. And there's a great Jill Bolt Taylor quote that says, we think of ourselves as um, thinking people that feel, but we're actually feeling people that think. Mm -hmm. And if you turn it that way, everything shifts because it's about how you show up and how you feel a space. And I think to your point, these um, spaces are contextual. David, you spoke about this yesterday. Context matters. And so you might be in a space where you need to focus. You might be in a space where you need to be at ease. You might be in a space where you need um, a sensual experience. It, the spaces 
what you need is context, and the spaces need to be designed for that. And there are some neuroaesthetic principles that can help to get you there, combined with, I think, the art of design and architecture, right? right. So, so David, one second. I have some questions. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading a book by an architect, Christopher Alexander, who attempted to codify, he wrote this book called A Pattern Language, where he attempted to codify these things, kind of what you're talking about, the things that make people comfortable, the spaces where they feel at ease, that feel nurturing, that, that, that feel like this is a, I, a place that I belong here, I feel like this is a place where I can be myself, et cetera, et cetera. Have you tried to codify any of these things? And are there any rules that you can name? That's the, that's the first question everybody has. It's a great question. What are the rules then? Well, tell, just tell us the rules. The rules just tell are. Us the rules you, and we're done. If you yeah. can be the same person you were five minutes ago, perhaps there's a rule I could make. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? We are the most neuroplastic people. So it's really also, actually, David brings up a really good point, which is my beef with architecture in general is that we're always designing for the least common denominator, you know, and especially when we make large projects, we're looking for that. And the truth is, it's not that we don't know how to design using neuroaesthetic principles. We use them when we do prison design. We know how to make people feel bad. We're just not oriented towards making people feel good. And I want to get on my soapbox as much as I can to get people over to the other side to say, can we start looking at it? From this perspective, we know that the, we know the power of this, you know. And maybe it's not the biggest power that's out there, but it's the power that I know how to use. So, you know, here I am with it. Um, but to your point, in terms of rules, there are some, like going back to sort of symmetry and proportion. Yeah, yeah. Those I mean, those things. are attempts at right. making rules. Right. Yeah. Our brains are wired to recognize fractals. This is why we like nature. There's so many fractals inside leaves and all of these kinds of things that you don't. Your brain is automatically doing these things. There's a phenomenon called pareidolia that Susan is working with, where it's our tendency to recognize faces in everything. You know, whether it's a house or a cloud or whatever. You or know, a tree. We're, or a tree. You know, we're sort of eyes in the aspens. You know, we, we look at these kinds of things, and we're hardwired to kind of make ourselves try and feel comfortable in various places doing these kinds of things. There's also, but for me, it really, you know, one of the reasons I'm really interested, A, I'm a science geek, besides being an art geek, but one day I heard about neuroaesthetics and I couldn't wait to get home, like figure out how neuroscience and architecture could come together, you know? And figuring out how this works, also as an architect I feel like we're multidisciplinary, our solutions have to be multidisciplinary, you know, we're in a very complicated world, we can't work in these kinds of singular silos, we've all gotta to work together to figure out how to make things be better. But also to really, um, I lost my train of thought there. I'll come back in a second. Multidisciplinary. Anyway, multidisciplinary, indeed. So to really like use technology, because like the Bauhaus, which has its its you know small remnants here, that was an example of when architects use technology. And in the last 50 years, I think neuroscience has been one of the fields in which there's been some of the biggest leaps. It just made sense to me that as a designer, I should be looking at these things. And therefore, the rules. One could develop, I do know some people who are working on developing rules. So eventually there will be mm -hmm. rules. You know, but as Susan said, it's a translation right. field. Trans yeah. Principles. Yeah, and we're really trying to build people's interest, people's support, because for me, I really feel like this is an argument for what I call design justice. I really think everyone deserves a space that supports them. Rick, Rick is in the audience, and Rick knows we're working on a project for um, the mental health of refugee children in New York and really to look at what design justice means. How can we provide an environment for everyone that allows them to think about their future and themselves and how they relate to the world in a better way? It's not just you know, a, you know, a, a visual thing. And like David was saying, if you look at anything on that level, it's such a small reading of the world. We have so many senses. Your body inside is feeling all kinds of things right now. You're just not tuned to figure that out. So, David, when you create a room, for work or inspiration? Like what, 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 are, what are the central features? What's necessary for you to feel alive? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I, I tend to want to create a little nest mm -hmm. where, uh, where the, the things that inspire me or the, th the tools that I need are all sort of within a, a, a step or two away. Uh, I can see a little bit of the world, but I don't, it's not like I don't want to see everything. That's a huge distraction. Uh, anyway, I feel like what you're describing, those are the, what, the stakes that we're talking about. This is, that's why this matters. 
uh, because it, it kind of nurtures us and allows us to have agency and do be what we want to be. I also wanted to respond to the idea of these biases that were on, on the video. Uh, when, when I was growing up, when I first came to New York, there was a kind of reverse bias. Um, and it still exists in many quarters. There was a feeling that um, if something was beautiful, it was not to be trusted. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was merely a seduction. It was, it was going to seduce you. It was a uh, mere surface. And, the, and <laughs> yeah, so watch out. Be, a, be aware of some things that are beautiful. That was the attitude. And so the artists and musicians and whatever would respond to that by making things that were intentionally ugly. Mm -hmm. Things that were ugly, things that were abrasive, music that was dissonant and noisy and painful. Because then you go, that's, the feeling was, this is authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because it doesn't traffic in conventional ideas of beauty. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true, any more true than the other, <laughs> the other things, but it's this weird bias mm -hmm that develops amongst kind of the, whatever, the artistic class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't talk about beauty and architecture for a long time. Um, certainly when I graduated and for about 20 years later, that was bad, that was a no-no. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're starting to bring it back and hopefully we're gonna be talking about things like equity and agency and empathy and those kinds of things that we need to be thinking about when we make a world. Well, and kind of back to the idea of stakes and you're talking about the nest. Um, so some of the folks that study touch and haptic um, systems, so somatosensory, we know that this shape, this curved space, either things that we make like cups or bowls um, that we can hold like this and it makes sense. How do we lift up water? What's the shape of a breast, right? What is the curve of a cave? Mm -hmm. That's a shape that evolutionarily we love and we feel safe with that space. Hard lines are not the kind of thing that we move to. So we understand the neurobiology of this space now, this idea of shape and more and more. There's a couple of folks at Hopkins that have done some beautiful work here and that's getting and let me just say, architects, we're not telling architects anything they didn't know, but they're using it in more strategic ways mm -hmm. for context and for purpose. And so it's the collaboration, it's the marriage of arts and science that I think is important. Science doesn't trump art, and artists have been so generous to be able to say, yeah, I'm curious. I mean, that's the thing about artists is that they're so curious. And so bringing this together helps to make the world a better place and a more a poignant place, a more place where we can flourish. And so I think that's really interesting too. Yeah, and, I, and as Sanjan said, you know, nothing brought home the importance of space like the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, people or their lack of access to things. And it's very nice and it's very important that people actually recognize that this could be more than just, just mm -hmm. visual, you know, where it's not just about spending money, it's not just about composing in two dimensions, it's really much more than even three dimensions. I like that you said it's not about money because the thing is that it's about access, affordability, and immediacy for most of this work. So you don't have to build a, a building in order to have these feelings and have the kind of respite. And I think that's also really important that it can be used in lots of places in many ways. And the idea of agency, which I think you're working with a lot, it's this, this you know, the choice. You get to make the choice here and there. And the way you allow people to make choice in space, whether it's you know, the view they choose to look at or what, uh, what options you offer them as a designer or an architect, um, these things matter, you know, the way that, that people relate to this. And there are a lot of studies in this, and it's been a very interesting world to explore along with a lot of other very smart people. Hmm. Let's go to questions. Right here. My name is Eric. Okay. I can hold it if you want. My name is Eric. I'm part of the Basel Scholars. Um, I had a question more on the philosophical side, but I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget. But what I said was, um, for me personally, the, the physical slash realistic world and the emotional slash mental slash fantastical world seems um, often feels disconnected for me. Um, however, when I see aesthetics or something very artistically pleasing, my emotional side becomes nourished and empowered. Um, an example I chose was in the movie, In the Mood for Love, 
Mm -hmm. um, there is this one shot where we see the back of Tony Leung and the smoke is coming from his head. And I found that very emotionally pleasing. Um, I felt enriched and I had to, I had the feeling to analyze it further. Um, and I, I guess I have two questions. The first one is how do you think I can enrich the physical world so that it feels more balanced to the emotional slash fantastical world? And my second question is, are there any aesthetics to focus on in the physical world that would balance the emotional and physical at an equilib equilibrium? Oh, such an interesting question. I'll take it with this. Um, um, uh, it's actually, and I think we're doing it because we're all trying to now starting to live in this sort of hybrid physical digital world. And I think that somehow is beginning to be, and I'm not, you know, there's a lot of, um, opinions about this, you know, I've written a little bit about the qualities of physical and digital space, and I think it's just as important to think about the emotional qualities of digital space as it is with physical, because I think at some point we do, we are hybrid, and we have to start thinking about that, but that's maybe a good way to bring it in, and in some ways the examples you give, Eric, like, that's, that's a film I love to use in, in sometimes when I give lectures to students. Another one is Sorrentino's film where, you know, the Japanese tourist comes to Rome and he just dies from the beauty of Rome. He just looks, he just dies, you know. And that's just this beautiful opening. It just is. And then he says, my name is David Byrne and I'm dead. And I'm dead. <laughs> like David does in his, in his show that you will get to see. You know, beauty has power. And that's the thing, I think, to take away and to really say, how do we explore that? I don't know what your subject is as a fellow, but it'd be really interesting to see what you do with it. So I live in West Baltimore. Ah. And if you know anything about Baltimore, uh, you, are you from um, Baltimore? I live in Baltimore. Yeah. Uh, that we have a gun violence problem and uh, you know other issues, um, but it strikes me that uh, the question of uh, you know the science of beauty can apply to neighborhoods mm -hmm. and cities in ways that address the equity qu uh, question, yep. but also address behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how far the science goes in terms of how the aesthetics of your built environment actually influence uh, behavior. Huge, it's huge. Um, and in Baltimore and other urban communities, we have weaponized um, urban spaces, right? We have no transportation coming into West Baltimore that's reliable. We have um, uh, no, there, there are food deserts in West Baltimore, although that's changing. You know, we've created environments that are very um, impoverished. And there, there was a study by a woman named Marion Diamond in the 60s that worked with mice, but she created an impoverished environment, a kind of semi-enriched you know, enriched environment, then a super-enriched environment where there were things to play with, things to do, places to, to rest and restore and come back. And what they found was that the white matter of mites' brains in six weeks increased by 6%. And so we know that for humans, enriched environments really change the way our brains grow and change. And T. Rowe Price, which I think you know in Baltimore, has been a real component, a real advocate for doing a lot of work in communities and using not only architecture and, and landscape design, but also um, bibliotherapy, so using books in schools to connect the Enoch Pratt Library, school systems, and cultural arts organizations in, in the communities to get kids talking about gun violence and street violence through the arts. So they're, they're reading, they're doing things, and then they're creating videos or uh, spoken word performances or dance performances to show how they feel because they can't talk about what they feel because it's too traumatic. So there's some, there's some really good work going on there in the arts. And David, you are doing that great project with school. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm curious, uh, I grew up in suburban Baltimore, very different. Um, I'm curious what, what you think could be done in the area you live in. First, we have a population problem, meaning that we have a lot of, I think, gorgeous uh, housing stock, but that's been abandoned. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, attracting population back to the area so that you don't have broken windows and mm -hmm. empty homes. Uh, I think that public art uh, needs to be a part of how we reimagine uh, the spaces. I think we need uh, to interconnect green spaces uh, throughout the city in ways that uh, bring people 
respite and a space for, for uh, contemplative uh, living. I think that uh, we need more water features. I, I think that uh, we need, you know, opportunities to, you know, interconnect, uh, you know, people uh, in spaces and places uh, that bring them together for a common purpose. Um, I think that what we currently have is built to bring out the worst behavior in human beings. It's almost like it's almost like it's a cage for animals mm -hmm. instead of uh, a place where human beings are supposed to live. You're, you're absolutely right. I do know some, a couple of architects who are working on um, both this agency question and homeownership and creating, you know, I can find out the information and see if I can get it to you. Might be helpful if it's something that you could get involved in. Um, but there are people who are working on that, for sure. Yeah. For one more? Aaron. Hi, good morning, I'm Erin. Um, it's very nice to see you. I have actually two quick questions. One, you had mentioned that there are many more forms of sense than the six, and I would love to know um, what other ones um, you're, you're referring to. And actually for David Byrne, I was wondering, you mentioned that you really enjoy the self-reflection that comes from asking yourself questions about why you've made different artistic choices. I would love to know what your favorite thing you discovered about yourself was. You want to go first? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, one thing I discovered was that if I make something or create something, I often don't know what it's about until it's done. And I, I did a project called uh, Playing the Building, where there was a, 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 an instrument, an old keyboard, and you'd press the keys, and it would set off a mechanical motion, like blow air through the infrastructure of a building, through the pipes, and there was little hammers that would knock on radiators or girders or whatever. So you could play this and make all these noises happen in this empty space. I thought it was a fun thing to do, but I, what I didn't realize what it was about was it was about democracy. Um, what happens, happened was people would come in there and go, I don't have any musical training. I can't do this. And then they'd see a 10-year-old kid wailing on this thing yeah. and making all this go, well, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can do it. Nobody was an expert. Mm -hmm. It kind of leveled the playing field. Everybody was as good as everybody else. And I didn't, that wasn't something I knew I was doing. I discovered that later. I, that's an interesting point that, you know, with all of the arts, you don't have to be good at them to have tremendous um, uh, benefit and impact, right? And I think culturally, we've we've been taught that if you're not a good painter, you're not a good mu musician, you're not a good singer, you shouldn't do it. And so we've shut down, and we shut down early, right? Like, you know, eight, nine years old, and then we stop expressing ourselves, and when we're not expressing ourselves. So sort of thinking about some of these extra senses, I what, one is vestibular sense, where we're starting to learn how we sort of stay balanced in the world. And with virtual reality, that's becoming more and more important because we're moving into these other sort of worlds that are places. Um, there's also a lot of work that's being looked at around, think about animals, how they can eco-locate. We're starting to understand how we know where our place is in the world, and that's a sense that we're starting to develop more and more. And also this sort of sense of um, energy, um, from each other and what energy gets created in a space I think is a really interesting. So, you know, what are we what are we either neurobiologically, chemically sub sending out to each other and what are we bringing back from each other? So those senses of, um, you know, we know that stress is a pheromone that is very contagious, so is joy. And we're just starting to understand these neurobiological ways that we communicate uh, chemically, but also electrically with each other. And so there's a lot of work that's being done there. And I think it's exciting to see it. So interesting that stress is contagious. Stress is, to well, you, we know it, right? We feel it. We felt it through the mm -hmm. pandemic. And what did we do? We sang. Mm -hmm. We danced. Mm -hmm. We painted. Mm -hmm. We wrote. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're out of time, but yeah. what, what a group. Um, thank oh. you all so much. Thank you.